Hello, I'm your host, Efi Pilarinu, and today I'm delighted to have a guest from Portugal, Hugo Pacheco, who is devoted to the digital transformation in Africa. And that's how I reached out to him on LinkedIn, as he is economist and coder at heart and publisher of the Barefoot Economist blog newsletter that, that you can you know, check out. He's worked with all the names that we Westerners know in Africa, like M-Pesa, Airtel, Ecobank, and I'm sure you can add to that. Let me welcome you first, uh, Hugo. Thank you, Effie, for uh, inviting me. Really appreciate that uh, you, you did this, and I hope to bring some awareness of the exciting uh, African markets and what's happening in, in this uh, financial inclusion and how we can uh, make this 1 billion people that are entering the internet for the first time acknowledge with financial tools that we, and at the end of the day, improve their resilience and life. Yeah. I mean, I have never visited Africa, not yet. Or although I'm lying now, in North Africa, I've been to Morocco, you know, as a tourist, but I'm talking about the Africa that I come across in with my fintech hat, you know, Kenya, Nigeria, Lagos, all those economies that are transforming. And at the heart, I've been watching, you know, mobile money, mobile money agent networks and, and the significance around financial inclusion. But it's only you, you only somebody who's been on the field and worked with the people can really give us a sense of the significance of mobile money agent networks in financial inclusion. And in my mind, Hugo, I think of this as one of the best examples of digital. It's not digital. It's, you know, it takes people and 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 people networks and digital tech networks to make this happen. And I think it's a great example to keep in mind of what a digital good case could look at. So can you start telling us a bit about this, the significance of these agent networks in financial inclusion? Sure, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, so financial inclusion is actually a big, a big catch, right? Everyone is talking about the one, well, one point seven uh, million people that are still billion people that are still out on on the participating in the economy. But in uh, to be uh, truthful, this number hints a lot of things because it doesn't explain how many bank accounts do you have, how many mobile money accounts do you have, multiple for one person. So it even the purpose of um, that is more deeper. And in, inside the access, it's also having an account is, is also the, the active users of, 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 of this account. So in, in a nutshell, you have financial inclusion, then the digital financial uh, institutions that uh, make make uh, possible to for, for people to, to access. And then you have these agents that are the cash in, cash out agents that help to, for people to participate with the physical world, like informal economy, cash-based economy, and also the new digital digital economy that is is bringing that are, are is starting to to to, to come uh, of awareness. So, digital economy. So, so may May I interrupt you here? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Mpesa is more than fifteen years old, and of course, there's many more uh, participants in the market. So. How come we the, the mobile money agents, the people are still needed, this cash in, cash out mechanism? Is the economy still cash based? Has it moved? That's a very interesting question. So and typically that's that's one of the, 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 the points that I try to bring awareness. So there's actually a correlation of uses of use of cash and digital adoption. And this is normal because you have your ins, the money that you get in, like you know, payrolls and, and, and your clients paying you. And then you have the outs, right? You, you need to pay bills. You need to pay your family. There's a lot of things going out. And until you balance this ins and outs, you are unmatched. 
and you need cash to be a part of this participation. So it's a natural process. And you see this in overall all the countries. There's two countries that this doesn't exist, and it's Sweden and, and China, that it, they are actually declining. So the adoption is actually end by hand. So there's a lot of uh, misconception about is cash, cash is bad and kind of a bad mojo around this. But actually, this is the reason that people are adopting the digital economy because they have, it plugs in with their life, they can easily on-ramp and off-ramp using this, this agent as a means. So that's one of the reasons. So you, you talk about Mpesa in, in Kenya. So that's kind of the, the vision that everyone uh, talks about in more, more buzzword. So there was a development in, in Kenya that uh, people wanted to send remittances internally. So I want, I'm in urban, my mother is in a rural area, then I need to send her money uh, on a regular basis. So putting myself in a bus and going there and to deliver the cash, it would take me uh, around five dollars to do 150 kilometers, for example. So the advantage that I have using an Mpesa account is that I pay the cash agent that is nearby me, and then my aunt or whatever can withdraw the money from the nearby agent. So there's kind of three components that happen with success. First, regulation was not so tight as, as it is in the world today. The second is there was already established and kind of anchor use case besides the transfer of money, and it was airtime. So people were already used to go to the agent to transact, paying to have additional airtime. So the economy is based basically in a trust environment where it's prepaid mindset. You need to pay to access a service. And the third one is the distributed network that existed. So these three uh, pillars made it possible. And that's why you don't see it anywhere else in the world. They have been successful in other countries. For example, a similar use case would be uh, a similar company would be uh, Bcash, uh, also in, in Bangladesh. There's examples of that, but uh, the, it was a kind of a, a conjecture of, of uh, uh, things that happened there. There's two additional success cases of, of this uh, financial inclusion model. It's the uh, government to people, and this is basically most seen in India or even in Colombia, where the government wants to give a, a beneficiary access to some kind of a, a, a UBI or some kind of benef benefits subsidized for agriculture, for example, and they can cash out that money on, on agent. That's the second one. And the third more kind of uh, new, it's uh, the, the Chinese model, how to integrate this with platforms. And that's kind of what uh, Ali, Alipay did successful with merchants, uh, but they were already cash cash agents uh, in, in a nutshell. So these are kind of the three flavors adding up to, to, to your introductory point. So I understand that the agent network is, is a sizable network. Can you give us a sense of what are we talking about? We're talking hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, you know, of course, in 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 a country and and what is the training required to become an agent? Okay, so currently, so this these numbers are from GSMA. Currently, there's 70 million, 7.4 million agents registered. So they, they this is where the entire Africa. Yeah. Okay. So they grow on a on a on a year on on year basis of around 40%. Oh wow! But then active, they they the you have seven point two million agents, okay. and this is more or less twenty five percent of them. That's uh, the the growth of active are around twenty five percent. So the two entries were kind of the big palm the gorillas are Nigeria and and, and Ethiopia that are opening up their initiatives more recently. So this is numbers from twenty twenty two. And so this is the reason why it, it's getting traction, <clears throat> and this is the proven means of incorporating people into the digital economy in Africa. Africa is kind of a big term because there's 56 countries, but each of them have their specific points. But in a nutshell, that's kind of the overall uh, number and how the network supports the transaction. If, if you look into the types of transactions, you have 23% are cash in, 16% are cash out. So this would be cash related transfers. But what's hidden in the numbers is that uh, many times the usage is a over-the-counter usage. So I'm in a village, I, I, I don't have an account, but I want to pay my bills. Uh, and I use the 
the, the agent as a means to do it. So this would be kind of hidden as a bill payment, but actually is a cash transaction uh, supported by by, by, by the, the agent. So you so you don't have an, an account with them pesos, but you go to the mobile agent, you give your cash, and they pay through the network your bill. That's it. So that's another point. So the, the numbers, even though maybe uh, reducing in terms of the the, the, the the cake is growing, but the, the um, part of, of the cash in cash out may be reducing, but that doesn't take in consideration all the picture. One very important topic is that when you're doing these types of transactions and you're starting to interact kind of with the digital ecosystem, the agent is actually nurturing you and guiding you into how you participate in, on this uh, digital economy. So it's about putting you on on a ramp and giving the necessary time for you to adopt if you want to go into more, let's say, digital life. So and, a and bit of it. a bit of an advisor, sort of speak, uh, saying to you, you know, there's this option to for a savings account or there's this option for credit or, or whatever it is. Is that the idea? That that's it. So the it's it's financial system. It's all about trust. And you don't trust, and even corporate companies that work on 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 urban areas, when they want to reach out to 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 more rural, the 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 mindset would be, but why should I do this? Why should I adopt this? And if you see, it's kind of similar around twenty years ago, maybe when you went into kind of insurance. It's a complex product. Why should I do it? And then you have agents that would, at the end of the day, nurture you and. and Putting you understanding what's different uh, of the options because Lexi can be uh, complicated. So this trust, and when you're designing the network, you want to uh, touch base base with the uh, uh, trusted ecosystems like uh, 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 religious uh, or, or or church related or some uh, a specific leader on 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 the, the village that could be nurturing uh, business related to agri uh, um, agri business. So you want to find out. What would be the best way then to to leverage this uh, this this trust because it will be uh, a good model for 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 everyone and that's how you you leap in, into so that you have typically two ways to look into this you have what what we call master agent that's someone that will contract directly with the with the with the financial institution and then is is uh, let's say em employee employees are under him right it could be for example a petrol station or it could be uh, a supermarket model. So you have these uh, different caveats of partnerships that we, we, we see to kind of increasing the network. And then on the other side, you can, there's already an outsourcing model for, for this, where you don't have the relationship, but there's an aggregator rule uh, happening here. So the agent or the merchant will continue to be um, attached to the, it, it will be attached to the financial institution, but there's an aggregator managing this kind of relation. And special, this is my special area of, of, of acting because there's an increasing role of also the platformification of where, where the world is, is happening. So it's uh, there are new players now coming in with e-commerce value proposition that will help the merchant and, and the agent to be on top of uh, their, their unit economics. And that, that's kind of uh, relevant because when you push this, you have two types of costs. You have the setup cost where you need to set up this uh, agent with the right training, with the right understanding, with the right liquidity so that it can transact the cash in and cash out both on cash and both on e-flow. And then you, you have the ongoing costs to support him, either in training, in ed education, new products that come in, and, and also nurturing in terms of frauds that can happen through the channel. So you have these two types and the, the, the platformification of the, the second one of the outsourcing it's actually where the new, more exciting news are coming because it helps to 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 balance the ongoing costs for for the agent or merchant. So it can be disruptive if there's a lot of people going there just to cash out. Because if you're a merchant, you don't want to say, "Look, I, I cannot serve you now of my products because I need to 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 I'm doing the agent." So you don't want this to break, and the the platforms help in this. So you see now some gig economy coming in as a liquidity agent to, to rebalance the merchants. So that's kind of interesting use case too. You see merging of, of some of the business to, to, to support the merchants, such as the, the use case that we talked about coming from China as a, 
as a, a relevant point, and also designing new support and liquidity tools for B2B, because at the end of the day, they need to buy goods for, the, for their shop. And so you start to see a design of supporting their, their own digitization so that they can then grow and support also the, their community. You reminded me, Hugo, last year I was at the World Mobile Congress in Barcelona. I'm not this year. It's I think it's going on today as, as we record. And I was impressed with some analytics that I saw there at the Huawei Exhibition Hall that, that they were looking at the, the data of the network of mobile agents to optimize it i guess i mean those were analytics i don't know who they use the who they give them to but looking at those analytics to optimize their network in you know to optimize so there aren't places where there's a lot of congestion and then others that are not you know that is there i mean you 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 spoke about training and, and we can come back about to to, to that the training and licensing and regulation. I want to understand that more. But before, I want to understand the unit economics for these agents. I mean, are they making money? What are the the setup costs, the running costs? What is, you know, what are we talking about? I understand that there's a lot of value from what you've already told us. There's the financial inclusion aspect, the social cohesion that is added, you know, especially in smaller villages and so on, where you have these agents that are already uh, trusted and, and they take on more and more role. But what are the economics? Are these viable businesses for the single agents or are they not really? You have to you know, be in a network? How, how is the situation? Okay, so that, that's a good question. So in the, the the way it works is that both of them, both the agent and the provider have costs involved. So if you look into kind of, of a hat of more agency banking, so it will be a bank providing these services, banks make money in two ways. They get interest on, on the on the the money that they do so it's a lot more driven by uh, deposit collection and and then they make fees on on, on transactions if you look into e-money uh, uh, provided like mobile money uh, it's it's about the fees because they don't hold the, the as a reserve the, the money so they need to have a partner bank then then holds, holds the reserve so they have two models as an agent you can make money on both and and uh, I'll, I'll go through that. So in kind of the the startup uh, costs, it can, they can vary, but in, can, in terms of cash and liquidity, it can come start with around one 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 thousand dollars to to start because you need money then to transact. So you need float uh, in in a nutshell to to do this. You need to part that money out. So there's an initial investment that you have. Then you that's like a capital. Do you have to maintain that capital? in your account as as there's turnover that's it that's it because you need to make sure when someone is depositing the the money you have to depositing will be i get your physical cash and then i transfer from my agent account to your account so, you know that's that's how the, the the model works so i need to have money in my account otherwise this this breaks from from the beginning and that, that's a, a relevant point uh, to, to start with because uh, trust breaks are, are, are a problem. We'll go there into the infrastructure. Then you have kind of the technology on the technology side. Typically on banking, you either have, there's a higher cost because it comes typically attached to car transaction. So you need to have a POS involved. So there's costs either for the provider, there's business models for either the provider or for the agent. So there's techniques that you can use like lease to rent or subsidizing this. There's different models to do that, but there's, that's, that cost exists. And this, this cost on technology can start on starting on $200, for example, to, to start with. So the, the for the agent, there's a considerable investment to, to enter this. On, and then for the provider, besides the, the models where they can subsidize a part of this, there's the branding costs, there's the channel management. So there's kind of a 
this is a life cycle where you need to recruit, you need to onboard, you need to train, you need to continue this starting point investment. And then you have on the other side, the ongoing costs. And the ongoing costs would be for the agent is more about the fixed costs that he has for rent, for staff, if he owns staff. So this is a cost for him, but also on liquidity. So if he runs out of money, what should he do? Should he close shop and go in cash balance and come back? There's a, is the provider, does the provider have available a line that he can do overdrafts for specific transactions? So this is where the complexity uh, gets in. But typically for a provider, uh, there's a distribution. He needs to pay the distributor. He needs to pay the agent. So the distributor will manage the network of the, of the agents. He needs to, to spend money on branding and marketing, and he needs to, to support the channel with help desk, the teams, the, the retraining, the constantly uh, focus on this. The, so this would be around $12 for the distributor, $40 for agent as commission, $5 as marketing, $12 as channel costs per agent. Kind of the unique economics of this. For the agent, the ongoing cost would be around $70 to $100 uh, dollars, uh, on, on, on a monthly basis. So for the agent is, and this is why business model is, is uh, designed and new platform uh, plays a very interesting uh, point because it helps on the start starter point because uh, technology can help you with uh, uh, models where you can, instead of having a POS uh, physical card reader, you can read it through NFC. So this is where it starts to be more interesting in, in terms of usage. Instead of having a card pushed, you can use different channels like USSDs that actually work offline without internet. And it doesn't bear the cost for the agent or the provider on or the agent specifically on utilities that he, he needs to pay. So these techniques and the new kind of agent uh, network model that are appearing more related to, to platform-based, they help in these two situations. The first is the startup cost because it's an app that can be consolidating a lot of functions that uh, are interoperable already with, with the banking core or the mobile money. The second one is that they can be interoperable. This means that you don't need to have the cash parked in customer A or the bank A, in, and you have your liquidity locked in there, then there's a different liquidity. This is a problem because I'm, I'm a customer and I am from uh, MPES and I go there and I, I want to, to, to deposit in MPES. The money is it's, it's not in, interoperable. Uh, and so it's still in, in many use cases closed loop in, in, uh, in, some, in some countries. So having an e float that helps them to transact with this liquidity, this is very interesting as well. So in a nutshell, the wallets are being driven to overcome this. And the next point, because of the costs are fixed, they need to, to when, when they are either dedicated agents that they only mediate type of, of uh, transac financial transactions, or they are uh, exclusive. If they are non-exclusive, they can do provider A, B, and C, becoming truly interoperable. This is where the model is more interesting because they don't need to do 11, average 11 transactions to break even during the day. They can reduce to five. And this is much more interesting, even if they are giving additional revenue coming from other sources. I'm giving you an example that we've uh, worked in the company where, where I work. We attach the identities into the agent model. So the agent now is not only cashing in and cashing out, it allows you to create a digital identity for the civil enrollment or for the financial enrollment, depending on, on these cases that you have. So this gives them an additional total addressable market. It, it gives them an, a, an additional source of revenue because these identity schemes are, are shared revenue with the networks and, and the providers. So it's all about designing then this unit economics to be more, more interesting. So in a nutshell, the capex for an agent could be now sixty sixty dollars, and the opex could be uh, five dollars on ongoing. Because you can design with these new tools ways to to overcome this uh, this challenge. Oh wow, wow, very exciting! One, you know, from the outside, you would think that the only evolution would be just to add new products and and grow the the you know the product offering but you're saying that the business model is is changing and 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 the the operating costs and and the interpro interoperability are really changing uh, everything they are 
So it's yeah. it's it's kind of, of a balancing of having the tools to ease uh, and uh, the entry point, and the and the and the capacity to this to increase the portfolio, but specifically with products that are uh, fitable for for that area. So it doesn't make sense to have. Uh, a lot of bill payments are offering on rural areas where the majority of the business is agri focused and people need to buy inputs and uh, inputs for for their their uh, agri operation and they have seasonality on revenues different from the urban where maybe you you could have a payroll ready uh, as, as as a customer or your business has some fluctuation as a, a merchant but they are more or less uh, stabilized because the afflux of people are quite regular. So the designing of this balance uh, needs to be taken in consideration depending on your planning to have a national footprint or localized footprint. And may, sometimes the strategy even changes when you go urban, peri-urban and, and rural. Talk about the personalization here is, is really innovation is happening. Hugo, I want to ask you about women uh, specifically. What is happening? How are women participating first as customers and, and second as agents themselves? Are women participating increasingly? Are they becoming agents or are they still, this is not a profession that, women are, are choosing or are being chosen <laughs> and as clients? Yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. So in a nutshell, when you look into the end banks data and giving the example in, in Kenya, that 20, 20%, from those 20% of end bank population, 13 related to specific woman profile. So there's a lot of things to, to be done. And it's a complex process. It's just not only the access to it because there's to to, uh, to become an agent, uh, there's constraints related to owning a phone, having a, an ID of your own. Uh, if you want to become an agent, your business needs to be recorded under your name. And sometimes it's not, it's under the family or 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 the or, or the husband. So it's 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 kind it needs to be the the the, the family that is uh, embarking on, on on this direction. I've, I've seen a lot of progresses, but we are beyond the kind of easy easy grabbing foods. Now it's uh, the, the the more complex about even the habits of, of traveling with money, safety with you know, women traveling with money. So there's a kind of bad, best practices of course uh, enabling uh, women. Uh, customers to to use financial services. So tailor, tailoring the financial services uh, at access point for women is kind of very important. Uh, and uh, clustering together groups of uh, women work better versus uh, working alone. So all in terms of uh, trust of uh, trusting area uh, of, uh, of of exchange, having uh, mobile agents that travel to women to to, to carry out convenience to to this trading that's also important. The cash-in, what I can see from data is that the cash-in are actually moments where people that people use to teach and to improve the digital and financial literacy. So typically, the the um, uh, when when you look into data from Saki Bank in, in India, you, you you could see that the average transaction is actually uh, bigger on women. Uh, so so there's relationship management that happens there when, when you're transacting, where, when, you, when you're onboarding people into the financial server in, services and you nurture that relationship. And then there's the, uh, the the designing of the outlets that needs to be more uh, gender, gender uh, in, in, uh, inclusive and the use of technology uh, also helps so with clear verbal and visual clues to confirm the safety of the transactions, all that part uh, is relevant, but it's a complex uh, topic because it involves not only designing products that are fit, and you see a lot of good related savings products that are tailored to, uh, to women, even though the kind of there's a, a lot of buzzword around loans and that specific types of you know, financial products. On savings specifically for women, there's a lot of uh, good difference, and you can see data from time bank in, in South Africa, a lot of people that use the, the, the services are young women, like 51% of, of, of the customer base is women. And they are looking into this specific savings account. So it's 
what they already did informally, they are using it to 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 do it formally now using the, in in that case the uh, supermarket network to to transact, but also the, the mobile application to 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 do so. So that's uh, the the complexity as different players, but we are we are getting getting there specifically on using the 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 woman as as a, as a woman agent networks because that's when there's the safety and the comfort to to start onboarding these types of, of, of concepts. Very interesting, uh, Hugo. Hugo, we could talk for hours. You <laughs> you are a treasure of of insights uh, directly from from the market. Before closing, I wanted to ask you. Uh, you know, you're in Portugal. How much time do you spend in Africa? What are the countries that you are more involved in and in, in, in what's your passion right now in that area of financial inclusion in Africa where you're devoted to? Uh, that's a, a tough one. So, uh, well, in a nutshell, what I see is that the digital economy is here and it will be available for everyone, but designing it can exclude people out, out of the system. And there's a lot of rhetoric about the humanization of cash, and that it's it's hard to to unpack this rhetoric. So what I'm currently doing is I'm trying to bring awareness of the different countries where I uh, I work. So I've I'm, I've been working in uh, Mozambique, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Ivory Coast, in Ethiopia, Tunisia, and South Africa. So all of these these countries, why I, I try to bring is the awareness of the importance of these agent networks, because when you talk about digital transactions, you always think about the convenience, right? That's what comes into mind, that that's the value proposition. So how do you consider convenience when you don't have an ID, when you don't have energy, when you, you there's a lot of restrictions that happen that happen here. And if you want to bring this one billion people into, into the ecosystem, you need to make sure you, you're uh, making sure all those points are, are being covered so that everyone can participate, is not discriminated, Either participating on on public money or 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 uh, private money. So this is uh, where we, where the importance of these networks are. For me, on 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 a personal note, I want to bring this awareness. I'm I'm uh, helping designing new business models that make sure the the value proposition fits the the, the segment, but also the business model is asset light and it's more about platformization of of the of the of the business model instead of asset core asset acquisition of, of the active of, of, of the, the the goods and services activities and resources for for the company so that's that's uh, where i see it's coming and uh i'm currently reading uh, a very interesting book called small is beauty and i think there's this what's it called Say it again. small is beauty oh, okay so this is uh all about how big systems tend to break and the resilience of small communities, uh, the importance that they have, especially on the quality and balance uh, of, of life. So we want to bring people into the financial uh, system, but we don't and we want to protect them that they don't go over debit with, with the with strategies and, pre- and could be predatory design uh, strategies for this. We want them to be safe and uh, at the end of the day, increase their their skills, increase their uh, capability on uh, acquiring jobs and revenue uh, constantly and bring more flux into trading into those those regions. So that's kind of where my head is uh, at the moment. Fantastic. Building uh, trust at the local level, but yet uh, in, in a, towards a platform uh, model. That's what I'm hearing from you. Hugo, thank you so much. It was really very insightful what you shared with us and uh, I will share with our audience where they can find you and your Barefoot Economist publication. Thank you. Really appreciate your time.